by introducing myself. I'm Alan Bliss. I'm the CEO of the Jacksonville Historical Society, and I welcome all of you uh, with gratitude to this evening's Speaker Series program. The Speaker Series is a regular monthly program on a topic of historical education relating to Jacksonville. We are getting back into uh, the tempo of the monthly cycle after uh, some disruptions from the last year's pandemic, which is not news to very many of you, I don't think. The speaker series continues though, and as always, we aim for excellence in, uh, in content and relevance, and so we're happy to be able to welcome this evening's speaker, more about whom you will hear in a moment. But first, let me thank uh, the underwriters of our annual speaker series, which once again this year is Jacksonville's Retina Associates, Dr. Fred Lambro and Mansoor Mughal. We appreciate their support. We also welcome and, and uh, say thank you to the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville for their underwriting of many of our activities through an annual cultural services grant, which is funded by the city of Jacksonville. We appreciate their support. <clears throat> Most of all, we appreciate the support of members, such as those of you who have joined us for this evening's program. We could not do what we do without a core of members who are not just financially supportive, but engaged with the work of public history in Jacksonville. We thank you for that. If you are not already a member of the Jacksonville Historical Society, please consider becoming a member. Your membership strengthens our work in public history. It strengthens our work in education as to the value of history and the relevance of the topic and the relevance of Jacksonville's history, and it strengthens our advocacy for historic preservation across the city. For more information about membership or other opportunities to support the Jacksonville Historical Society, please visit our website at www.jackshistory.org. And with that, I will now introduce Dr. David Jamison, who is um, my colleague in historical education. He is a professor of history at Edward Waters College. He is a board member of the Jacksonville Historical Society, and he is the chairperson of our Educational Programs Committee. And in all of those capacities, I welcome him and appreciate his participation. And he'll tell us a bit about this evening's speaker. Dr. Jamison. Thank you, Alan. I'm very pleased to be here tonight and uh, that those of you that are here could make it. Just to, to share these ideas, the idea of, of sport is supposed to be a place where we can get together and, and compete on equal footing with, with other people and there are rules and there's fairness and we learned this from the very beginning, first in the playground, that you know there are. Th this is how life is. That there, there are things that we compete in, and we do the best that we can, and and we trust the people that that teach us those those rules. And these are these are things that are sort of fundamental to our society. As an internationally recognized legal expert on sports issues. Nancy Hogshead Makar has testified in Congress numerous times on the topic of gender equity in athletics and written numerous scholarly and lay articles. She's leading an effort to turn the Olympic movement back into a service-oriented, athlete-centric nonprofit, one whose corporate structure protects athletes from physical, emotional, financial, and sexual abuse. And we're all aware of the many changes that have happened to the Olympics because of the the amount, uh, the, the commodification of the athlete and the, the, the spectacle that's become. And sometimes we forget that there are, there are people there who go on to live lives afterwards. Mrs. Hogshead Makar's book, co-authored with Andrew Zimbalis, is titled Equal Play, Title IX and Social Change, and has received acclaim since its release from Temple University Press. She's been teaching sports law related courses for, for 20 years and is now the founder and CEO of a nonprofit entitled Champion Women, which provides legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. But before all that, 
She herself was an athlete. It, you, you might recognize her if you uh, are familiar with Jacksonville sports legends at Episcopal, it was called Episcopal High School back then. Now it's just a called Episcopal School. She was undefeated, did not know the word defeat, then went on to uh, Duke for a year, Duke University for a year uh, as a champion swimmer and went to the Olympics where she won three gold medals and a silver. I, I don't know what happened with that silver. I guess you, you were slacking on that event or something, but good job with the other ones. No, I'm kidding. I think you actually, I think I, I YouTubed it. I think you lost to a teammate. So, um, yeah. so good. Yeah. So go USA. No I, no, I should have gotten second. She was Tracy Calkins, who, if you know my era of swimming, she, I got second place to her many, many times. <laughs> That's excellent. And then after that, the, the law career began, uh, a civil rights lawyer, and then going on to do more than just literally rest on her laurels, which is something many of us can't say, but to really become, to, to turn the uh, work that she has done and the, the, the name that she had made for herself into doing something for all the other athletes, all the other people, all the other young people who trust in these institutions. Uh, she's decided to give back. And part of that is just speaking about it and educating and, and telling us, revealing to the world uh, truths that you know we might want to sort of turn away from, but we can't be denied. So uh, Nancy Hogshead Maycar, thank you for the work you've done. Thank you and welcome for speaking to us tonight. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jamison. I appreciate that very warm introduction and um, that introduction to sort of a history of sport. Um, I'm gonna take you on a quick 50 year journey. Um, here, okay, here we go. So, let me make this nice and big. <clears throat> um, so this um, um, is, uh, I started Champion Women because I realized that uh, I'm, well, I'm almost 59 now, but I realized when I started it that kind of time was running out and how could I get the biggest bang for the buck? How could I, um, how could I get change to scale? So as an attorney doing individual cases, many of you might remember some of the cases that I've done that maybe impacted your families. Um, in 2009, I sued the Florida High School Athletic Association because in a budget cutting move, remember the economy tanked and they cut between 20 and 40% of all seasons. Okay, so 20 to 40% of all games were gonna get cut except for football. So 30% of all boys did not have their seasons cut and 100% of all girls had their seasons cut. So um, we sued because, I mean, we tried to work it out, of course, uh, that was not successful. And um, so um, as soon as the boys basketball team figures out that the girls basketball team is gonna get reinstated, they pushed the Florida High School Athletic Association. And because of our efforts, we were able to get all the games restored, not just 30% of the girls, like by law, that's all I can say to the judge, your honor, 30% of the boys have their seasons. So 30% of the girls should have their seasons. So, uh, so uh, um, in addition to that, um, um, uh, we, we, you know, it's, it's amazing how often that Title IX is used to save both men's and women's sports. And we're gonna talk about that quite a bit here. So here's what we do is um, our efforts, the one I'm, I'm gonna talk about two efforts today. Uh, one is this effort to get equal educational opportunities for girls and women, um, mostly in college sports. That's where our efforts are targeted. We just found out today that USA Today is gonna help us with our uh, information and get it out there, getting our website out there. I mean, you cannot ask for anything better. Uh, and, um, but, but we're, I don't want to get incremental change, right? I mean, that was really great. And we actually, when I, did, when I did that case in 2009, it actually impacted four states. But again, that's, it was full time for about two and a half months. So, how can you get change to scale, not just individual cases? So we do a lot of sex discrimination in athletics. That's what I'm gonna be talking with you about today. We do a lot of sexual harassment and abuse 
when I, um, I got my second piece of federal legislation passed that had to do with changing the mechanics, the dynamics, the governance of how the Olympic movement works. My guess would be in the 20 years that I've been teaching sports law that most people understand pretty well how high school sports and college sports works, what's the fundamental dynamics that, that are going on there. Most people don't know about the Olympic movement and that was working to the disadvantage of athletes. If you get an opportunity to watch Athlete A, I highly recommend it, it is phenomenal. So, but that was the, that was the dynamic that we were trying to change. Um, employment discrimination, women who are in coaching in particular have a very tough time. Pregnancy discrimination, um, coaches used to regularly tell athletes that if they wanted to keep their scholarship, they had to get an abortion. And so the NCAA hired me to come and write the pregnancy and parenting policies. And um, we, we showed how sort of both sides are illegal. You can't tell a woman she has to have an abortion. You can't um, penalize her for having one. Um, um, and uh, uh, fortunately, right as I was writing this, we had Dara Torres who um, was in the Olympics and had a four-year-old. So we had some really great role models of, you know, the, 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 the thinking had been from a coach's perspective that pregnancy ruins a woman's body and she's never going to be a great athlete after that. And then we had territories. Uh, so pregnancy discrimination and then LGBT discrimination. And I'm going to talk today about, um, I've done a lot with gays and lesbians and what we're doing right now with uh, transgender athletes. How can we include them and yet still preserve the category girls and women, right? So how do we preserve making sure that women have equal opportunities in sports and at the same time, all right, so it's, it's trickier than you might think. Um, okay, so this is, this is like basically the slide that says, believe me, I have to say, <laughs> Sports Illustrated recently rated me as, uh, they ranked me as, um, on their list of the most powerful, most influential and outstanding women in sports, the game changers who are speaking out, setting the bar and making a, dis a difference. That was a, a very nice day to get that. Okay, so there is a website and there's a, there's a statute that was passed about not quite 20 years ago uh, called the Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act. And that statute requires schools to provide information about their men's and women's athletic department. In lots, it has lots and lots and lots of data in it. We looked at only three metrics in that data set, okay? Um, um, and one was, were schools providing men and women with equal educational opportunities in this form called sport? And then two is we looked at, are they providing equal scholarship dollars between men and women? And then we looked at, are they treating them the same way? And we just picked one metric that is easy to uh, analyze on the EADA for some 2000 and some schools. Um, and we looked at recruiting dollars. So were, men, were schools spending equal amounts of money for men and women for, um, for recruiting, okay? And according to law, they're supposed to. And um, what we found is that the gap between men and women is horrendously huge. It's roughly a third of what women are owed. They're, they're missing an entire third. So they're being denied, women are being denied in college 183,000 opportunities. Women are being denied almost a billion dollars in college scholarship dollars. Women are being denied um, 162 million in recruiting um, recruiting funds. So to me, what this says, so somebody like me, who I was an Olympian in high school, um, um, if there was a college scholarship available somewhere in the country for swimming, I was going to get it, okay? But what about my teammate? And what this says is that for a lot of girls and women who want to participate in sports and who do not get a college scholarship offer and they do not have a team to be able to participate on, they think they're not good enough. They think they didn't work hard enough. They should have worked as hard as their brother worked. They should have been that talented. And the truth is they are being denied this because they're female. 
they are not being offered an equal educational opportunity called sport. What's really tragic about this is what difference that a sports experience makes in somebody's life for the rest of their life. We know they get more education. They are more likely to stay in the workforce full time. They, um, they're more likely to major and pursue careers in STEM. And uh, they will make more money and they will be healthier for the rest of their lives. So everything from breast cancer to osteoporosis to, um, to mental health, um, all the metrics that you can name a, a sports experience is really important uh, for somebody's lifelong um, career opportunities, all right? And then, um, so how bad is the problem? If you look, so I, I've been doing this for way too long. <laughs> so like without exaggeration, for 25 years, I've been giving the slide that has just the, the bottom two with the gray and the blue lines. And I would usually say like, hey, look, see how big the gap is. And um, notice that both for the men and the women that, that the lines are going up. Well, guess what? Um, when you look at how many more women are in college than men, so in other words, one out of every uh, roughly uh, 20 men has an opportunity to participate in college athletics, one out of every 20. Um, in high school, it's about, you know, 60, 70% of high school students uh, participate in, in sports. But when you get to college, boom, that number goes way down. So now you're talking between, and I'll show you some numbers in just a second, but you know, you're talking for big schools, for all the power five schools, it's less than 2% of the student body is participating in sports. Um, so when you look at like, do, do one in 20 women have that same opportunity to participate? This is the gap. This is what girls and women are owed. They, if, if women and men were getting the equal educational opportunities, they would be getting this pink graph here. So spoiler alert, the, the gap is getting worse. In, the last, in, in 10 of the last 15 years, more participation opportunities have been added for men and there has been a total of a 27% increase in sex discrimination. A 27% increase, okay? So this is for the ACC where uh, I think, uh, yeah, Florida State University is, there it is. All right, but okay, so imagine the ACC, this is where the money is. <laughs> These are the rich schools who in total are denying women $45 million in college scholarship dollars. They're denying women almost 1,500 opportunities to be able to participate. For somebody to say they're a division one ACC athlete is a huge deal to put on your resume to, and to deny that many women with a sports experience to treat them so much less, to give them $18 million in recruiting $18 million less in recruiting dollars is also huge. But let, let's look at some of these numbers here. Let's look at Florida State. Florida State needs to add $3.6 million to, uh, its, to its women's college scholarship dollars. It needs to add over 100 opportunities. Depending on the size of the team, that's anywhere from, you know, two, probably three, but three to five teams. That's, a, that's not a small, insignificant amount. So when you think of you know, the high school athletes that you know who are lacrosse players or who are, um, uh, who are gymnasts or who are you know, all these different athletes and, they, and Florida State is not providing women with equal opportunities to participate. Uh, University of Florida is about the same, um, um, and they they're they're giving they're prioritizing recruiting men over recruiting women here. And you look over here a percentage of the student body that gets to participate in sports. I was telling you I was going to show you this earlier. See, Florida State is only giving 1.7 percent of their student body uh, with a sports experience. Some some private schools that are much much smaller have much bigger athlete populations. So um, Duke is offering 9%, but Duke is, they need to offer roughly the same numbers of opportunities and the scholarship dollars are also equally way, way, way off. University of Virginia needs to add $4.7 million in college scholarship dollars. Um, 
then we did, um, we, okay, so this looks pathetic and I could continue to show you awful pathetic things. We, we, I, this is a terrible slide and I apologize for so much data, but here's what the, the, the takeaway of this slide is, is that women can't escape the sex discrimination. So it's not like, oh, if I just move from the power five and I go to say a non-football conference or I go to a uh, division two conference or I go to division three or I go to a Christian school or I go to an HBCU or I go to, it doesn't matter. There is no place that women can go in the country where they do not face very serious sex discrimination. Um, um, okay, and so we, we at Champion Women, we, um, we shifted strategies. We did have the strategy of, we were writing like what I was considering like free legal work that we were giving to all these um, uni universities. And we blanketed the university with the information. And we thought like surely if somebody with power, not the athletic director and the president of the university, they knew how bad it was, but surely, uh, say the women's tenured group or um, the women's studies department or the Title IX office or the chief diversity officer, surely if they knew these easy metrics, um, they would do something about it. So that strategy failed. It did not work. So we shifted strategies. Uh, we built, in 2020, we built this website, Title IX Schools, T-I-T-L-E-I-X Schools. Then we sent letters to all the conferences that had all the data with things that looked very much like this for all the schools. Uh, and then, um, um, so, what we're, so when COVID hit and all these schools started dropping teams, we, Champion Women, reached out to the schools that the teams that got dropped. We got them on a Zoom with like 150 of their families, athletes, boosters, alumni, all on the same screen and kind of walked through, here's what Title IX action looks like. And, um, and you know, here's what it means to be involved in a legal action. And um, we have been successful in every single case. Whew. So, Clemson is actually the first school that we did not initiate, but I'm thrilled to say that the men are suing, saying you're not giving the men equal opportunities because they're apparently giving more women. And then the women are suing at the same time saying, you're denying us $3 million in scholarship dollars and you're denying us, um, I think it's like $2 million in recruiting dollars. So you're not treating us the same way that you're, you're treating the men. Um, so, um, but when you look at William, I don't know if you're keeping it up with this, but William and Mary, um, University of Iowa, uh, Dartmouth University, um, Brown, um, Fresno State, um, San Diego State University, um, they're all us, whoop, right here, Jacksonville, Florida, yes. <laughs> um, and we're not, in most of the cases, we're able to use Title IX to save both the men's and the women's program. Again, the law just says equality. We can't go in there and say that uh, we want uh, a men's and women's program saved, but politically. So we look at Title IX as one arrow in the quiver of keeping uh, opportunities. Um, in when it comes to measuring athletics, these were my girls way back when they were seven, they're now 15 years old, but I have this picture of them when they're seven, just to give you an idea of, because sports are um, separate but equal, okay? So Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, we learned separate but equal is bad, you need to have integration. When it comes to sports, if you're gonna have girls and women have equal, op equal opportunities in sports, they need to have their own team because of science. So if you just had one team and whoever makes it, makes it, um, you, you would almost never see women on the podium. Um, even Olympic uh, high school boys in both swimming and in um, uh, track and field can beat Olympic champions. Um, so 
uh, so what, so because you have this sex segregation, it actually makes measuring discrimination really easy. And the reason why I have a seven year old pic a picture of them when they were seven years old is because they went to their third softball practice and they said, Hey mom, how come the boys have a concession stand and we don't have a concession stand? Why do they have a scoreboard? and We don't have a scoreboard. Why do they have dugouts and we don't have dugouts? Why do they, right? And it was like, so there, there's this thing in the law called the laundry list that measures how it is that you look at whether or not they're providing equality. You would have thought that they had like looked at the law and said, hmm. But the truth is measuring equality in a sex segregated world is really easy, okay? Um, Okay, so every law, so I kind of walk through, and I'm actually not going to do this because you guys are much more sophisticated, but when I, it, every law, uh, every, every lawsuit just looks at two issues, right? What are the facts? Was the light red or green if there was a car accident? And then what is the law? Okay, after you determine, okay, the light was red, does the person who's next to the, per, next to the driver, do they get to recover from the driving through the red light? Does does the person who is standing on the sideline, <clears throat> those are all questions of law, how far the law extends, et cetera, right? So that's all you're, they're looking at, questions of fact and questions of law. Some of you may know my husband, Scott Makar, he is a judge on the First District Court of Appeal, and his court never looks at issues of fact, unless there's no way that a jury could have made that factual determination. Like there's nothing on the record that would say the light was red, right? They didn't have any witnesses or any, nothing there okay barring having no evidence they pretty they have to leave the factual issues al alone and they're only looking at questions of law okay so when it comes to title nine and when it comes to looking at athletic departments and measuring sex discrimination it's really easy because you say what do the men have and what do the women have so women are not entitled to anything nothing um, except whatever it is that the school's giving the men. So if the men are getting a really substandard sports opportunity, okay, so they have terrible facilities and they just have a, a, um, a research assistant who's doing the, the uh, coaching and uh, they don't have very good competition, that's what the women get. But if the men are getting this, um, you know, they're, they're literally eating gourmet meals. They have the most amazing medical care and they get all these special tutors and everything else. Then that's what the women get as well, right? So it's not rocket science, folks. Uh, so I kind of walk through what's the law with the students, okay? Um, another fun fact on uh, the law is um, this, see this statute, Title IX? It's actually based on another statute, Title VI, Title VI, so see this word here is sex, take out that word and put in race, color, national origin, four words, and put in the word sex, it's the exact same statute. So remember in 1964, we had the big omnibus civil rights bill that had to do with voting and public accommodations and housing and you know whether or not banks could redline and all, right, it just, it was the Mac Daddy. It got a ton of information or of statutes through women were not included in that for, for education. So, so uh, we, we barred discrimination based on race, color, national origin in 1964, not until 1972 did we bar discrimination based on sex discrimination. So then just to like, you know, throw home the point even more, if this is what the, what the women's bathroom looks like, um, you, you have no idea if this equals sex discrimination or not. It could just be a nasty, disgusting hygiene issue. It is a civil rights issue if the men's bathroom looks like this. Okay, all right, I think I've overdone that point. Okay. <laughs> so again, schools have to provide the three things and it's an and test, they have an and underline there, meaning that um, if schools offer lots of participation opportunities, but they still don't provide equal scholarships or equal treatment, it's still a violation of Title IX, right? They have to do participation and scholarships and treatment, okay? 
Um, and then this is the part that most athletes who are on campus that they feel acutely. When I was talking earlier about the laundry list that my seven-year-old kids can look at and be able to see, this is what I'm talking about. So they want uh, equal equipment and supplies, that they um, scheduling of practices and competition. Um, it used to be that first the boys got to got to have their practice right after school and then the girls were after that. That's that's a no-go. Um, equal travel and per diem. Uh, and like particularly these division one power five schools, we've got men's teams that are traveling on private jets and women's teams are still traveling on buses. This is 50 years, folks, 50 years after the this, this law is passed. So, and this, all this laundry list stuff, this all was, these are regulations that were passed in 1975. So nobody can say like, well, I didn't know what you were talking about. Um, um, all right, so I, I don't wanna get into, into, the, into the details here. Um, okay, so I actually prepared this um, initially for University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And, um, so we looked at, um, at UNC Chapel Hill, they need to add, um, uh, we looked at two different data sets, one from the EADA, the one that where we made this website right here. And then there's another data set that you can just go online to their athletic department and they say like, we have a tennis team and you count one, two, three, four, five, right? You just count men, you just count women, okay? So, uh, um, you, you, you'll see here that uh, EADA says they had 532 athletic opportunities for men, but the rosters uh, only said 486. Uh, for women, they had they said that there were 426, and there were 300, and, and there were only 369. Uh, so at UNC, uh, according to EADA data, they need to add 360 women to their athletic department. Um, and according to the roster spots, they need to add 351. These, this is huge. Now, I already know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, but come on, you know, doesn't men's football, doesn't men's basketball, don't they bring in all the money? And, and can't you, isn't that a, a, an appropriate legal defense to sex discrimination? And the answer is no. Okay, so I want you to remember back that Title IX was based on Title VI. Title VI was passed because racist um, donors wanted to fund buildings that only white people could use. And so Title, IX, so Title VI says, it doesn't matter the source of the money, the school has a responsibility to make sure that the school is not discriminating based on race. Okay, so and if you remember, if you look at the, the title of the statute, it says no person shall on the basis of race, color, national origin, or sex discrimination. There's two other statutes that follow along. One is based on ability, and the other one is based on age discrimination. So, so no person shall, meaning no student who's at the school shall experience sex discrimination. So whether or not the money comes from television rights or sponsors or ticket sales or donors um, or a COVID-19 budget crunch, it is it is a no-go. You cannot discriminate based on where the money comes from. The school always retains the obligation to treat men and women equally. They always retain the obligation. Um, uh, they, 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 uh, a school can't say, it's not us that's discriminating. It's the donor, okay? They, they donated the money to be able to build this facility you just can't do that what's unusual about sport as opposed to the classroom example i was using is that in sport when somebody gives to the baseball team they're giving to men so the school has to even that out usually when you give to a building it's a multi-use building that's used equally by men and women uh, so <clears throat> one of the things that we noticed is when we talk about treatment and the, the equal treatment um, part up, way up here is um, this is what current students notice. They know that they are getting second class treatment. This is not good for women, for them to know that in the one place that we sex segregate that they are being maligned into second class treatment. It's also not good for the men for them to think that they're supposed to be getting more, that they're supposed to be getting better treatment. Um, that's just not, not healthy uh, for them to be going that way. 
Um, this has to, this, uh, again, study has to do with why sports experience, why sports are such an important uh, opportunity to be able to participate. Um, um, can Title IX prevent a school from shrinking its athletic department? If um, in the Florida High School Athletic Association case that I launched off with, uh, can, if, a, if, if, the, if the FHSAA said that all programs are gonna get 30%, including football, including all sports, they were all gonna get 20 to 40%. Title IX could not have helped at all. Okay, so it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't dictate what the athletic department looks like, right? You can have very luxurious or very Spartan. Um, all it says is equity between men and women. Um, can it prevent wasteful spending on, you know, buying out a football coach for $10 million? It cannot prevent that. <laughs> um, I think uh, this, um, this um, cartoon is good, except that I, instead of having this college football player here, I would have, you know, uh, you know, Swoofford, or I would have, um, you know, I would have like the head football coach or I would have the, uh, the head of the conference, I would have them be sitting up there, not the player, the player's not making any money, they're getting terrible head injuries and um, not getting any medical care for the rest of their lives. Um, so I would, I would not put the player up there, but, but, but you know, one of the things that we try to do when we get everybody onto these Zoom calls is we try to have the men's and the women's teams in it together. Because what we say is that all of these like fighting amongst themselves of like, no, no, you have too much. No, no, you don't, right? All that works to the advantage of the athletic director and the conference commissioners who were just raking in the money hand over fist and to the detriment of the athlete and the athlete experience. So we, we try to get the guys on board and, and have them and their families and everything support what it is that we're doing here. Um, so um, um, in order to be able to assert the rights, we, it, it takes current students. Current students don't want to sue their school. <laughs> they do not want to be involved in legal action. So what we're good at doing is creating a community so that they don't feel like that they're losing community, right? We, that they, that they, um, you know, that they, they have the support of the parents and the boosters and the alumni and right all, they have this support network. Um, they have really good Facebook pages. They have really good, um, you know, facts and data that they like to throw out. Um, but, but to expect an individual athlete to do this, um, you know, we're, we've gotten pretty good when the team gets cut. Our next challenge is how do, we, how do we remedy these huge inequities when a team is not cut? So that's what we're trying to do. Um, um, about, um, I wanna say two years ago, this issue of transgender athletes moving into the girls and women's category started happening and I have been working with civil rights groups like the ACLU and National Women's Law Center forever, real, literally 25 years, 30 years. So um, they went off in a different direction, which is they want the goal of full inclusion. So no, no taking into account the sex linked advantage that um, trans girls and women may have, but no, don't necessarily have. And so, um, so we created this group with myself and I don't know, Donna Devarona, she's on the board of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee now, uh, Martina Naftalova, Donna Lopiano. In their world, these are all huge dogs. Um, and then on our supporters list, we've got Chris Everett and Pam Shriver and we have uh, Willie Banks, he's held the world record in the triple jump. He's very politically active. We have Edwin Moses, we have four trans athletes. Um, who are part of our team. Um, uh, and what we were worried about was that you, people were looking at it, it as an all or nothing opportunity, right? So it was, it was uh, a lot of this, a lot of people uh, who were trying to use sport as a way to inflict damage and humiliation onto trans athletes. So we don't want that, right? Um, 
And at the same time, we did want to preserve the reason for the girls and women's teams. It's hard for people to wrap their heads around. I've been saying literally for 30 years, if you want to give girls an equal opportunity in sports, they need their own team. Because people often say, why don't we just have one team? You only have one engineering class. You have one music class. And we just see whoever makes it, makes it. So why in sport do we sex segregate? And it is because of these biological, physical differences between them. So uh, on one side, this idea that trans girls are girls for all purposes. Um, and then the other side is um, trans girls and women should be excluded from girls and women's sports. There's a legislation in Idaho right now that passed. Um, this is supposed to be a picture representing recreational sport. Um, there's really no reason not to have full inclusion in recreational sport or intramurals. There is reason to do it when it comes to competitive sport. So we, had a, we have a, our solution. You can go onto our website and check it out. But it is to protect girls and women's competitive sports while including trans girls and women with appropriate accommodations. So why? Because of the science of sex. So uh, the idea that trans girls are girls is an ideology. It is an opinion. It is not science. Um, and it is that science that tells us the need to have a separate team for girls and women in competitive sports. Um, so when we look at like what kind of accommodations can we have, um, we looked at like separate scoring or, you know, have you guys ever like seen like a pro-am where they're playing all the way together, but at the very end they have different podiums, um, uh, different events, uh, handicapping, um, right? I had thought that uh, testosterone was kind of like height. So this is like the graph for height. This is women. This is, this is the graph for height for men, right? So men as a class are taller than women, but there are plenty of women like me <laughs> who are taller than your average male, okay? So, uh, so I thought testosterone was like that. And it turns out it's not. Testosterone is women are between, fall between 0.06, over here, and 1.68 roughly over here. Um, and whereas men, so then you go one, you go to 1.68 and men start at 7.7. .7. So 1.6, 7.7, those are not in the same universe, right? Those are not, um, those are massive differences between those two. Um, if a biological woman, um, a, um, a cis woman, um, happened to have testosterone in her body that was in this category over here, she would be disqualified because they would presume that she was cheating. They would presume that um, that's the only way that, you know, it has to be exogenous testosterone in order to be able to be on this, in this field over here. Um, oops, sorry. Um, we, we just, we, in our, on our website um, that you can check out, <clears throat> but if you look at this <clears throat> chart, this is just, you know, your average California, you know, the best boy and the best girl for high school sports for the high jump results. And look at the difference. These are, these are like the normal differences between boys and girls. When the, I thought that, that this is me from 1984, I know, beastie girl. Um, and I thought I had male testosterone. I thought like I had, um, um, that, you know, I was sort of on the same wavelength, if you will, men, well, three children later. No, I had uh, I, I, um, normal female testosterone. This is a uh, it's very rare for a Caucasian woman to be able to put on muscle. Um, I just have the genetic quirk to be able to put on muscle. Um, <clears throat> um, all Olympians are kind of quirky in our own different ways, but, um, um, but I was nowhere near in the category of my, you know, I competed all the time with another, athlete, another swimmer, Pablo Morales, and Pablo went about 18% faster than I did. So 
Uh, okay, so let, let's say you don't like how we have sports like, oh, well, maybe we should slice it differently. Instead of having men's categories and women's categories, maybe we should slice it in a different way. <clears throat> and it doesn't matter how you slice it. If you did it by height, if you did it by weight, if you did it by wet, uh, leg length, if by wingspan or by age, post-puberty, or ability to remove lactic acid from the body. Some people say, oh, well, Michael Phelps, he's got this amazing ability. Okay, so let's say we segregate based on ability to remove lactic acid. We have those people in one category and, right, in all of these cases, no matter how you slice it up, you're not gonna give half the population an equal opportunity to participate unless you sex segregate, unless you segregate by sex. So our example is we, we have people of color as well uh, to, to make this point. Missy Franklin and Ryan Lochte, they're both multiple Olympic and world champions. They both had, they both had the best um, training and facilities, et cetera, right? They did, in other words, it wasn't that Missy, because she's a female, didn't get equal access to really good coaching. Okay, no, no, no. She had phenomenal coaching, the same quality coaching Ryan Lochte had. They both held the world record in the 200 meters, but Lochte's time is a half a lap ahead of Missy Franklin's time. Her world record would tie for 50th in just the Olympic trials. So if we did not sex segregate, you just would not see, I mean, we, we've been working all this time to have sex segregation and then for people to appreciate and to to laud, to give equal prize money for this, for women's opportunities, for women's sports. Um, sort of sport already figured it out that when testosterone doesn't matter, like in equestrian events or sailing, it's co-ed. Then, then you have one team, you just see who makes it. You don't have men's and women's equestrian or men's and women's race car driving. It is objective. Um, um, and then we kind of go through the law and I don't want to bore anybody, but, but our proposal is with the Equality Act is it's all based on when somebody goes through puberty and whether or not they're, um, if they have never been through male puberty for whatever reason, sometimes biologically people don't go through male puberty, um, then there's no reason why they cannot compete in the women's category. Um, if they have been through, but they've mitigated their sex-linked advantage, then the NCAA and the IOC say they can compete. If they have not mitigated their sex-linked advantage, then they cannot compete head-to-head -head in the women's category. So, um, so we, we kind of lay it out here. <laughs> So this is an athlete that has not experienced male puberty up here. This is an athlete that has experienced male puberty and is not on hormones, okay? So a trans girl or trans woman who um, for whatever doesn't want to be on hormones or, or whatever. And then over here we have a, an athlete that has experienced male hormones and they are mitigating that sex-linked advantage by by um, reducing their testosterone levels and taking lots of estrogen. So we, but right now, like a lot of people really don't like this because right now the two sides are so loud. There's the one side that says um, complete exclusion and then the other side that says complete inclusion. And we're trying to say, surely sport can figure out how to make trans lives better. Trans, transgender kids, I mean, they are in a world of trouble. Uh, uh, the rates of sexual violence that they face, the rates of suicide that they face, surely sport can be helping rather than hindering. There's just no reason why we can't have um, another heat, why we can't have a different podium, why, why we could not include, right? Or making sure that we have, um, that we make sure that, that it's, a, it's a good environment for, um, for, for athletes so that if they did want to compete on the men's team, so plenty of women compete on the men's team, right? Which is Sarah Fuller, 
just introduced the Vice President Kamala Harris as part of the inauguration. So Sarah Fuller was a football player. And um, so plenty of women participate on the men's team. The issue with, with women playing on the men's teams is harassment. So address that issue, harassment, so that they feel comfortable being able to be who they are participating on the men's team. Right, so you have all these different options depending on you know how much, how much. Uh... Thank you very much. I have during the course of your discussion, I've been thinking a lot about a former student of mine. Um, I used to teach at uh, one of Florida's um, self-professed flagship universities, not FSU, <clears throat> the other one that's closer to us in Gainesville. And uh, a former student of mine was a standout athlete in high school and competed for and secured a uh, spot on the, uh, the team aligned with uh, the sport in which they had competed in high school and then got a full scholarship to the University of Florida and was able to participate in a uh, nationally competitive performance and nationally competitive team there, uh, graduated uh, and acquitted uh, themselves very successfully academically and went on to a career in professional athletics and eventually wound up as a coach at the high school uh, where they had initially distinguished themselves in sports. You probably already know the gender of this student was female. She was also African American. And it, this speaks to the point that Title IX is part of the great continuum in the arc of social justice and the movement for civil rights in the United States it's part of the great arc of civil rights history. <clears throat> you alluded to the Civil Rights Act earlier of 1964 and pointed out Title IX as a logical successor to that. When I teach on this subject myself, I emphasize that the civil rights movement really has a long historical reach that dates back to even before the formation of the United States. And it didn't end in 1965. It didn't end in 72. It didn't end in 79, and it has not ended today. And I think that's part of the message that, uh, that you're signaling, signaling. So I'll get off my soapbox and after, ask if there are questions or comments from our audience. I thought I saw a comment in the chat. One of the listeners, she said she was discouraged to learn that Title IX is not standard in schools by now? Maybe, Nancy, you want to address that? Why, maybe yeah, essentially, why there hasn't been much of a change? Yeah, essentially the adults in the room left. So the NCAA used to require schools to have a gender equity component to this. It was a process called certification. Mark Emmert came on board and did away with certification. So now they have this other process called IPP, but essentially it's just, they just report data. It's not, it's, it, they, they, a school can discriminate all it wants to, and they, the NCAA won't do anything about it. Um, um, the, the, if you look at who gets hired for um, the, the position of being the Title IX coordinator, the, the, by law, every school has to have high school, uh, elementary school, every school that receives federal funds has to have a Title IX coordinator. And um, they'll hire somebody right out of law school or right out of college. And so to ask them to go against the athletic director is just, there's just not a power balance there. Um, um, yeah, I could kind of go on and on, but, but so that's why we settled on, you know, I'm not a particular litigious type, um, but, and, and if, I used to say in my bio, like how do you figure this out without litigation? And I just don't see it happening. I think that, that, um, that that's why we're going specifically in this, in this, we're out right now to, um, to for athletes to be able to bring these actions to remedy this intentional sex discrimination. And much like uh, during the civil rights movement, the law was passed and then institutions in, in that case states, but in this case, colleges find ways to just circumvent or, or, or make do what they were doing before and dare anyone to try to push them or force them to do something about it. So yeah, even though the, even though the law is there, uh, it doesn't mean that life is changing on the ground, unfortunately. 
Right. You have to be, you have to, um, you know, you have to find a lawyer and go to a judge. And here's the thing, in, 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 because of the sex segregation, because of this doctrine of separate but equal when it comes to athletic departments, that, um, that plaintiffs, the athletes, have won every single case that has been decided on the merits. So some cases lost, like the judge or the, the attorney didn't get class action status and the athlete graduated, so they didn't have standing to be able to bring the case. But when, when, uh, when they're decided on the merits, plaintiffs have won every single case. So for me, when I'm looking for lawyers who wanna take these cases, I just need a good litigator who hopefully has done a class action before, <clears throat> um, but you know, who knows the federal courts and who, um, right, but, but it's, it's unusual that they are gonna have ever done a Title IX case in the past. And I, and, but I can, I can give that lawyer all sample pleadings and legal memos and, and right, all the, everything that they need to be able to do it really well. Um, um, and uh, yeah, get them going. The point being that passing a law is not only uh, not enough, it's oftentimes just a start. It's true. One of the things that makes America a great country is that we can sue to have the law enforced. It's true. <clears throat> it's true. Yeah, we, I mean, a lot of times like women come to me and they say like, you know, do we need to get a statute passed or do we need to have something from Congress or do we need to, da, da? it's like, no, no, no. For 50 years, women and men have been working on this issue. So we have all of, you know, under the legislature, you know, three branches of government, we've got everything from the legislature. It's all equal means equal. Then we have under the the executive branch of government, the administrative agencies that enforce the statute, we have all those locked up, right? It's all the, they all say the same thing. And then all the court decisions all say the same thing. So it's actually an unusual area of the law where that it is so uniform. There's not a lot of like, you don't have to watch out about, you know, certain dis certain circuit courts or, right? You just don't have to worry about that. You've got <laughs> equal means equal. Other questions? So if you know of anybody, have we questions? Other questions or comments from uh, our audience? Oh, Pamela says, you're the RGB for this topic. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Also, we always need donations. I know that the Jacksonville Historical Society does as well, but Champion Women does too. And if you go on to our website, championwomen.org, we have a donation page right there. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you, uh, Alan. Dr. Jameson, thank you. Thanks to the JHS's Director of Marketing and Communications, Kate Halleck, for organizing this evening's session and for uh, creating this technological marvel, allowing us to share this experience together. And thanks to every one of you who attended. We appreciate your interest and engagement with the Jacksonville Historical Society with Jacksonville history more generally. We really salute this evening's speaker for her engagement and her outstanding example of citizenship. Thanks to you.